This is Hannibal here from TheHannibalTV.com. And as my special guest today, I have a man that I've known for a while now, former WCW superstar, former WWE superstar, the son of Stan Stasiak, wrestling legend. I believe he's in the WWE Hall of Fame, former world champion. And you were known as Neat in WWE. To some fans, might remember you better as that. You are now a doctor of chiropractic. You are a superhero and an alter ego. You have a lot going. And this is also airing on your YouTube channel, Sean's World. But the reason I am talking to you today is because you were on the infamous plane ride from hell, the dark side of the ring did a documentary on and you've never told this story public and you're going to tell it tonight what your experience was on the play ride from hell. So thank you for doing this with us. Yeah. Hannibal, thanks for having me. And it's funny, uh, you and I have uh, been talking for the last, I, I think the better part of this year and is the first time we've ever connected uh, FaceTime. We we're just talking about that. Next step will be meeting in person and maybe you'll get, to get a chance to get back down here to Dallas. And it is called Sean Stasiak's World, but I just started this YouTube channel. Uh, please subscribe. I'm just starting out. Love the support and uh, the love. Um, anyway, yeah, man. By the um, way, I will just plug it right now, December 11th, since we are also on the World Class Pro Wrestling YouTube channel. They are coming to Southern Junction in Irving. Maybe I'll hook up with you that weekend. And yeah, looking forward to awesome. meeting you in person. And we are going to do a full career interview with you September 30th, just so the fans can mark that down. Absolutely. Cool. Um, okay. Playing right from hell. So, you know, that's so crazy because uh, I guess the documentary just came out on, on vice uh, dark side of the ring. And I watched the clip. You sent it to me last night and I've been under the weather the last couple of days. And I was, I couldn't sleep last night. So I'm tossing and turning. It was like, 5 a.m. and I'm like, you know what? Let me just watch that damn thing. So I, I started watch. I watched it from my phone, and I got to tell you, the time that I was done watching that, I was depressed, man. I felt really bad. I felt really, really bad. I felt bad for that um, the airline stewardess. You know, her story, her her perspective, her experience of that trip, and just to be associated with that, it just made me feel. I just felt. Ugh, I felt awful. Um, so, you know, I have recollection of that flight that was over 20 years ago. And, you know, I, it's funny because I'm listening to all these stories in the documentary and I'm learning this for the first time. I'm thinking I was on that plane, but we were on for, I guess for 14 hours, Devin, I don't even remember. I don't even remember being delayed for seven hours on the tarmac in London. So I, I don't, it was a 14 hour flight. Apparently I was on that flight. That is the, plane ride from hell and there's rumor and i want to ask you this real quick there's rumor that there's there was more than one plane my understanding and my recollection was there only there was only one plane that left that that night to get back to the states okay there here's the clarification on that because i've researched it further jonathan coachman who was on the plane ride from hell is claiming that vince was not actually on that flight and may have been on a different flight and there is some confusion that there was another European flight somewhere around this time where Vince and Kurt Angle wrestled. That was not this plane ride from hell. So some people are mixing the two together. Dave Meltzer is reporting that at the time he was also told Vince McMahon wasn't on the flight. So the confusion is, was Vince on the flight? And also there was actually another flight where Kurt Angle and Vince got into it. That did not happen this time. Yeah, and that was confusing me because I don't recall seeing Kurt on that flight either, Mark, you know, Undertaker. And when I heard that story about them having a takedown tournament in the aisle of an airplane, I said, that's nuts. That's crazy What's going on. And, you know, you're 35,000 feet up in the air. And in this case, the plane went right from hell. We're, we're, we're sailing over the Atlantic Ocean. So, um, yeah, but here's the thing. From This is my recollection. I made some notes here, and I'm just going to go through them on what I remember my experience. But again, you got to realize this was over 20 years ago. Um, you know, I never, I didn't look, and I don't want to say what's true, what isn't, uh, you know, because everybody has their side of a story. The thing with Ric Flair, 
uh, really disturbed me to hear that story. Now, whether or not that's entirely accurate or true, I don't know. I don't want to say one way or the other. I know that Rick was known to Nate, as they called it, which he liked to have a good time and would put the robe on. And I remember him having the robe on in the plane. This is one of my memories that I remember because up at the, I was like in the middle or towards the back of the plane from what I remember. And I remember going up towards the front when things or some chaotic stuff going on. Uh, one of them was Flair in his robe walking up and down the aisle. But I thought it was funny because I didn't see anything with the stewardess, that that story, that supposed story. And I'm not saying I'm not I'm not calling either side. I was just very disturbed to hear that. I, I wish and ho wish that wouldn't have happened or hope it wouldn't have happened. That whole story. But. You know, I re I do remember at that point that was probably well into the trip. And I, I remember going up towards the front of the plane and I just remember my mind thinking, I never, I don't recall seeing Vince on that plane. Uh, since I heard that Michael Hayes was, or maybe it was Michael Hayes, maybe it was someone else, was so intoxicated, they went to take a leak on. They thought Linda McMahon sitting in in one of the one of the seats was the was the stall. Like he was that was supposedly seat. also on another flight, from what I understand. Okay, see that? okay, I don't know. I this is I'm getting the two confused too. But this this is the the plane ride from hell where. You know, Flair was up, you know, walking up and down the aisle with his robe on and, and just uh, Nation, I guess, is how they say. Um, I know Bradshaw had a cut on his head. I guess he was sleeping and uh, Hayes popped him in the head and opened up his, his forehead, I guess, slapped Hayes and knocked him out. I didn't see any of that. I didn't see the Brock Lesnar, uh, Kurt Hennig wrestling match. I do remember, though there being a lot of concern and commotion with those two. And the time that I got over to the area of the plane where it happened, it was pretty much, you know, resolved or people were kind of settling back down, but I guess they ran into the emergency door. You know, I'm hearing the story for the first time going, man, what would have happened if they would have ran through the, would have popped that lodge, that door open. We probably wouldn't be here today, you know? Um, but I remember Jerry Lawler and Jim Ross, I was standing next to them and they were just watching Rick do his, you know, up and down doing the aisle thing with his robe on. Um, and just, they were just in complete, they were just disappointed and they, they were just like, man, it's like, it's unbelievable. I can't believe we're, we're seeing this or whatever. They were just really disgusted with the whole thing. That's, that's pretty much, you know, my memories of that plane ride. Um, I don't remember Dustin singing. I'm going by all what I saw in that documentary, Dustin singing to Terry, uh, on the on the uh, intercom, I don't. Uh, I did hang out with Nash Hall and X Pac in the back of the plane a couple times. They, they always took me in, and they were always cool to me, so I felt comfortable hanging out with them. Um, at that time, I was riding with RVD, so Rob was doing his thing. He was quiet, doing you know. I think he was just I think he was reading a book of all things, and just went to sleep. I I'd had my little section across from where Rob was, and. But I would get up and go intermingle with people and just, you know, having a good time, but nothing out of the nothing crazy, just socializing. But all the craziness, I just didn't I don't I didn't really witness, to be honest, all those real detailed stories of just some of the more disturbing things that happened. I, I don't I wasn't there. And I didn't or I, I didn't see it. I should say I was on the plane. I was there, but I didn't see it. That That's pretty much my you know, take on that whole plane ride from hell. I will say this. I do remember this was kind of funny. Um, I don't know who it was, but Big Show was in a seat on the aisle. Uh, aisle way, he's, so, he's a giant. He's so big. And he's, sitting, <laughs> he's falling asleep or he's sleeping. And someone put shaving cream on his head. And as soon as they, there's a couple of guys that were up doing it, they're ribbing him, right? Putting shaving cream on his head. And he just woke up. And just rah, blew. I never seen a giant, a guy that size, run so fast down the aisle chasing whoever he get his hands on. When I saw they were doing that, I just dove into one of the seats. Right, wasn't even my seat, but just got into an empty seat because I didn't want him to think that I was part of it. Because that's the last thing you want is a pissed off giant on a tour chasing you in an airplane thirty thousand feet over the Atlantic Ocean. Um, I remember Scott Hall being in bad shape when we got off. The, uh, when we landed in the states, you know. Um, that was uh, that was disturbing. 
you know, Scott is documented and has, has been well uh, vocal about, you know, his his issues and challenges um, with that, that kind of stuff with, you know, alcohol and substance abuse. So, you know, I think that uh, that wraps it up for me as far as that plane ride from hell. To me, it wasn't really a plane ride from hell. It actually was, as ironic as it sounds, it was actually a fun trip. I actually enjoyed it. That's the bizarre thing about it because I wasn't in in the mix of all the craziness, I guess. I just was there enough to socialize and be, um, have my own experience with it. And it was, to me, it was, I guess, because I never got in trouble for anything and I wasn't involved with any of that other rift raft, if you will. So that's that's pretty much the plane ride from hell experience for me, uh, being on that plane. There's a couple of fans on here that want to know who won between Lesnar and Hennig, from what you recall. I know you didn't actually see it, but I'm sure you heard the talk. You know, I, from all the stories that I hear, it almost seems like you, you don't, you didn't really get a final result of who came out on top. It almost seems like it got broken up. Like you would think that Brock would just demolish Kurt. God rest Kurt's soul. I love Kurt Hennig. He was one of the one of the main reasons why I got into professional wrestling. Uh, my dad wrestled with his dad, Larry the Axe Hennig, and knew Kurt when he was just a, a young boy, young kid. So for me, and I'll get into this in our our full interview, uh, um, you know, on the thirtieth. But I guess you know Kurt was pretty scrappy too, and you're in a small confined space in a plane. I don't know. I guess he held his own. So I, I don't know what the end result would be or was. I, I would have to say if I was a betting man in Vegas, I've got to put my money on Brock. But I don't know who came out on top on that one, to be honest. I think it just got broken up and it was just a big hoopla. You mentioned to me before you were still friends with Terry Reynolds. She said in this that Brock had exposed himself to her uh, on that pay-per-view before the the plane ride did terry as a friend of yours who also managed you for a while ever mention anything about that to you at the time no no i never in fact during that time i wasn't working with terry anymore i'd worked with terry briefly when i first broke in my rookie year and um i had even left wwe went to wcw had my wcw experience before i went back to wwe my second tenure and um, I was doing a completely different, I, we, you know, we, we didn't work together at that point. And I never, you know, I, I like Terry. She's always been cool. And in fact, when I first got in the business at that level, when I got elevated to the, the main roster, she, you know, she had been around a few years and, you know, you learn little tidbits from everybody. Um, just little, little things that make a big difference. So, but she was always cool. We always had a good rapport. I enjoyed working with her. I thought we had, I felt comfortable working with her, vice versa. I think she felt the same way. And but I never we didn't really have deep conversations and it was just more hi bye and how you doing? How, how's your daughter? You know, that's that's pretty much it. I never I I've again, these are stories that I'm hearing for the first time. And again, you you really have no recollection if Vince was on that flight or not. God, I just don't know, Hannibal. I don't I don't I just I don't remember. I want to say it's weird, you know, like you're you're trying to take your mind back to something, and I'm trying so hard, but I'd be lying to say that I knew for sure he was or he wasn't. I just don't know for sure, and you think I would, you know, but I do remember there was a a, a level or a sense of thought or like I guess awareness that hey, at the very front of the plane is where you know, the executives and the, and the office people are at. And I, and I want to say that he was there, that Vince is up at the front. And I thought I, back then I knew that. So, you know, I just had no reason to be up at the front unless we had to speak about something or whatever. He'd call me up front or maybe I, if I needed to go seek him out or whatever. I, but I just, I think in my mind back then, I remember, I know Jim Ross was up at the, towards the front of the plane. Um, Jerry Lawler, I guess Paul Heyman. I don't know. I just I don't I don't remember for sure if, if Vince was there because the whole thing about the it, look if Linda that whole incident about whoever was going to take a whiz on Linda thinking she was the stall 
that story, um, then you'd think he would be on the plane then because his wife, Linda, is there, right? You'd think for sure he's got to be on that plane unless they take separate pl flights. But I would think that they would travel together. The family would, right? So I, I don't know. I just don't know. And it bothers me because you think I would know. So because you you were in the plane and you didn't know most of this stuff that was going on that's all coming out and people are getting punished over right now, you could see if Vince McMahon had been on the plane, there is a chance he might not have realized that it was as bad as it was as well. Well, I don't know because the plane was pretty big, man. I mean, from what I remember, I mean, I don't understand how I, I don't understand how I did not know or have a better grasp on some of these detailed incidents that happened. I was on the same plane. So I guess it was pretty, I, I guess it was a 757, 747. I don't remember the size of the plane. You know, I, I, I had a couple of drinks, I'm sure. I mean, I was never out of control. I mean, life's all about balance, right? But uh, I just don't remember. I don't remember. You would think that, you would think that if all that was going on, he would probably would have would have intervened, right? But that never happened. So maybe he wasn't. I, that's the, that's the weird thing. He took a separate flight, separate plane, private plane. That seems to be the big question, right? Was Vince McMahon on the plane? I don't know. Someone's got to know. Someone would know. And finally, a bunch of the fans on here are wondering: Is it true that somebody had? Well, I think Jim Ross actually said this, that somebody had put Michael Hayes' ponytail in a Ziploc bag and taped it up in the locker room. I never saw that either, but I heard that story. I didn't see it get uh, cut off. Although I was hanging out with the NWO guys, uh, Hall, Nash, and, and uh, Sean, x -Bach. We were hanging out. In the, you know, I hung out with those guys for a while and had a good time. They were fun to you know be around made the trip easier, but I wasn't around them. I guess I must have gone back to my area of the plane or went to sleep or I, whatever. I don't know. I just, but I, I guess what Sean, I guess, or someone put it in a Ziploc bag and the next night there was, it was TV. So they, they pinned it up on, on the, on a wall or door or something that they were going to auction it off or something. And I guess Jim Ross from the story is he walked by and saw it and grabbed it and, and took it down before Michael Hayes saw that. So, cause he was already very pissed off that that even happened. So I can't imagine what he would have felt like seeing his a piece of his hair, a chunk of his hair, uh, stuck on a wall being auctioning off. <laughs> now the last thing, did they have any type of meeting with everyone to address this? Or was this just something that, they talked about for a little bit to people privately and people like you who weren't involved in any of the incidents, nothing was mentioned. Oh God. I feel so, you're asking me all these questions and I'm sitting here trying to rack my brain around it. I can make up a story and say, yeah, they, they, you know, I just, Devin, I don't remember that either, man. I, I would imagine they did. I know that I never did anything to, to land me in hot water. I wasn't part of any of that serious nonsense that went on you know the craziness that went on um so i i don't remember maybe they i'm sure i mean some some guys got fired didn't they they fired uh scott hall and and kurt hennig unfortunately um dustin came close i think and rick flair you know got a pass but i would imagine you know those guys had a talking to obviously right X Pac got a pass too, apparently somehow. Yeah, I guess he did. Yeah, I don't know, man. Hey, professional wrestling and politics, right? It's like peanut butter and jelly, goes hand in hand. So that's for sure. And you were kind of one of the victims of that, but we're not going to get into it today. There's a lot of questions on here for you that fans, uh, September 30th, we will get into that in his career interview. This was just to address the plane ride from hell situation because it's been in the news. So thank you very much for addressing that. And is there anything you want to plug or, or say to the fans well, here? Yeah, I do want to say what my plane ride from hell was, and it was part of WWE, and I'll share this with you. We were in, uh, and you'll appreciate this because you're Canadian, 
we were in New Brunswick doing, uh, a, or we were in Canada, but we were finishing our last show in New Brunswick. And I was working Randy Orton actually that night. This is before Randy, he was just developing. And they actually, st it's funny, they stuck Randy with me to kind of take care of him when we were in Canada. So I was kind of showing him around, you know, just he was kind of, kind of under my wing, I guess, so to speak, right? He was a real young kid then, like probably in his early, what, 21, 22. Anyway, we're in Canada. We had we had good matches, Randy and I, too. Had good just good dance partner. We flowed. Everything flowed well. Wish we had an opportunity to really work together, you know, later down the road. I guess they say never say never, right? Never too late. You never know. But anyway, my, my point is, is um, so they came to all of us before we were heading back to the States because we had Raw, I think, in New York City or somewhere on the East Coast. I think it was New York. Mass Work Guard, maybe it was maybe New Jersey. It was one of one of those uh, one of those um, East Coast, Northern East Coast towns or cities. And um, they said there's a snowstorm coming in, a blizzard, snowstorm. So, like if your match, if you had eight minutes, get it done in five. You know, everyone was cutting their time to go home early, so we could get on the charter and get back to the states to beat the storm. Well, everyone, you know cut their matches early and we got on the plane all right but we end up mistiming something and we get end up getting caught in in the storm in the air on the way you know probably a couple hundred miles out you know maybe, maybe an hour an hour outside of uh landing and it was brutal man i don't know if you've ever had i mean you probably flown quite a bit you've had some experiences but you know i've flown my whole life i don't recall ever uh being that freaked out. I thought like this, this really could be it. Like you're going to, you know, the world's going to read about the WB roster went down in a plane and that's it, you know, because that the, the wings were just bending and just, I mean, it was just bad turbulence. It was this, it was, that was a plane ride from hell. It went on for like 40 minutes straight. It wouldn't let up because, you know, you hit turbulence for a while. It's like, okay, it's kind of sucks, but you get through it. Right. But this thing just wouldn't stop. And I'm looking at the wings outside and they're like bending. And I'm like, these things, how are they even staying up? These things are going to snap off any minute. And you know, it's pretty bad when Big Show is right, right in front of you. And he's just like got his head buried in the front seat. And he's just like, just like, I guess he must've been praying or something because he was, he was freaked out, man. So anyway, we got through it obviously, but you know, that, that was my plane ride from hell with WWE. Very good. Well, that does seem a little bit scary for sure. You could have used the open bar on that one. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't enjoy it. I did not enjoy that plane ride from hell. That first one, the infamous one, I enjoyed that one, ironically enough. <laughs> yeah, I could see the fun side of it. And again, the woman, for whatever reason, didn't press criminal charges. And I don't know. I don't know enough information about the actual settlements and court cases to really judge that it's anything more than hearsay at this point um, but it's unfortunate yeah. the whole situation yeah it's and that's what i you know when i watched that last night i just felt wow these are it's kind of weird uh, to be in the vicinity or at the same place in this case in a tube thirty thousand feet up in the air over the atlantic ocean I remember that flight. I remember bits and pieces. A lot of details are just vague to me. I can't remember. But um, but after watching that, these are people. This these are their purpose, what they remember. So, and I think that some of the same stories have been repeated, and they're pretty much at, like aligned. Like they're pretty accurate, right? So, I'd venture to say that certain stories are. Come on, they happened, right? But the thing with the the stewardess or the uh, the flight attendant, I just, you know, that's someone's wife. That's someone's could be someone's mom. She actually was a mom to, to a young daughter. It could be as someone's sister, you know, think about how would you like someone close to you, you know, being in that environment, that's just uh, have to come home and, and say, Hey honey, how was, how was your flight? You know, you got to think about the dynamics of how that affects other people. And, you know, we're like, no one's perfect. We all make mistakes, you know, Mike Enos told me a long time ago uh, so that professional wrestlers were basically junior high school students with money. And, um, you know, the boys will be the boys, I guess. But to me, it's unacceptable. I don't care. I mean, that's a culture of pro wrestling, the boys. And But, you know, you got to have some integrity and have 
have some respect and you know you can't make excuses oh well, they're drunk and popping pills or whatever they're they're not in their right minds come on you got to take responsibility I, I again i don't want to say that that i don't know like the validity the details of the story it's 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 her story a little fabricated or or blown out of proportion is it is it exaggerated or is it not you know so i don't know and i like rick flair i mean come on who doesn't i grew up watching him man you know he's a legend so i love rick flair it's disappointing though when you hear that about one of your idols or one of your let you know a legend of a of a someone's asking if you ever saw a, through a, the helicopter spin a, a genre of something that you really oh it looks like hannibal disappeared there you are um yeah that's what that's what my alter ego does man it makes people disappear see that i was already working my magic uh it's not even halloween yet but um yeah man it's just disappointing to hear that i felt sick to my stomach i woke up that's probably why i don't feel that good either i'm not feeling that great as it is hannibal the last couple days and i watched that i was like i don't even feel worse man i wanted to go throw up i didn't i didn't it was it was uh it was the whole thing i didn't i'm just glad that i wasn't part of any of you know the serious crap that happened i just and i hope that um it almost seemed like that lady you know and look there's some more there's over central um uh, what, what do you call it? Um, sensationalism going on. There's the music and the sad, you know, while she's talking. And but it just it came across as something just like she was uh, traumatized by this. And for and who knows how it affected her, you know, after years later. She's I, I hope she's got her wits and she's overcome whatever that might have caused. You just never know what psychological damage or or what how you're going to affect people. You know, words, the things you say. Um, I've learned this myself over the years. You know, we're not perfect. We make mistakes. I've screwed up many times, and I've, you know, I've, I've conducted myself in ways that doesn't reflect who I really am as a person. Like, you know, you just, uh, but you just, I don't know. That, that to me, when I, when I saw that that documentary, I just, uh, I felt really bad for that lady. I just was like, if I, if I would have been, let's say that was happened all over again right now, there's no, no way in heck I would ever. I'd have to intervene. I don't give a shit if it would have affected me. I would have got heat with the. You can't let something like that happen, man. You can't sit there and watch that and see that and just not do nothing. I could. I couldn't. I couldn't live with myself today. You know, I just would. Maybe yeah, they'll just, make a movie no about problem. this sometime. Yeah, you never know, right? And then they'll have me on there as a character that doesn't remember shit. And <laughs> Uh, everyone wants me to ask you, and I hate to ask you this, but they all want to know if you've seen Flair do his naked dance uh, ever not. in your career. <laughs> you've been around him. No, I've never seen a naked dance, man. No. <laughs> um, Maybe your dad has. I don't know, man. Uh, um, <laughs> who knows? My dad used to do some funny things, man. My dad was a bit of a ripper, too. Um, the only real experience I had with Flair was pretty cool, actually. I don't remember how it all happened, but we had to get, I think we, I, I don't know if it, we were going from one town to the next, we were going to be in the car for like a couple hours. So I got to ride with him. He said, Hey, you want to catch a ride with me to go to the next town or so I forget what it was exactly, but I rode with him. I was waiting for somebody and, and he was getting the rent a car. I forget what happened, what the scenario was. God, I feel like I have amnesia. I can't remember anything, uh, Hannibal. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe I do. I had one too many concussions. Who knows? But, uh, it's just been so long ago, you know, it's hard to remember 20 years ago, but I do remember him saying, Hey, come. And I'm thinking, I'm going to ride with Ric Flair. Damn right, man. I hopped in and I remember because he came through Portland, you know, uh, when I lived in Portland, Oregon and Portland was a territory back in the territory days. And so they guys like Ric Flair, Rocky Johnson, that's how I met the rock Dwayne Johnson, you know, when I was 10 and he was eight, you know, when Rocky came or, you know, Rocky Johnson, his dad came through the territory, Andre, the giant Harley race, Ric Flair was one of them. So I remember watching Ric Flair once or twice a year coming to the Portland Territory back in the late 70s, early 80s. And then here I am in the car with him. Fast forward years later, I'm in the WWE now and I'm with, uh, you know, the 16 time world heavyweight champion, Rick Nature Boy Flair, and just picking his brain. And he was very authentic, very real, very personable. Just a real person. I felt very comforted. Actually, he reminded me of my dad. You know, just and you know, it's funny. And we'll, I won't. I better shut up because you're like Sean. We're gonna run out of time on our interview. We have like part ten. You know, as much as I talk, you should tell the fans how many 
audio clips I've I've left you and and how much we've talked. We, I, every time I talk to to Hannibal here, we're like, shit, man, two hours just went by. This could have been another podcast, you know. But, yeah, um, the uh, see, even my dogs come in now to uh, to tell me to close it off here. But uh, yeah, I'm only going to have five questions, and I don't even think you're going to answer that for your career interview. Well, how long's the? Hey, let's have a bet here. How long's the? Um, how, and I promise I won't shortchange my stories then. So, how long is the interview? An hour? Yeah. Five questions. Can I answer five questions in an hour? That's the big question, fans. Yeah. Hey, is you, that you fans, write in the comments of this video what five questions you want me to ask him. And all, so I have some to choose from. Hey, uh, is that Piper? Yes. Okay, She's cool. Let's see. Piper. I'm going to say hi. It's already oh. cold, getting cold here, so she got her yeah. sweater on. How old, is, how old is she? She's nine. Oh, wow. What kind of, is it a poodle? Yes. I had my first, dog, poodle. my first dog ever, her name, was, her name was, or his name was Pepper. It was a poodle. That's why, same color, everything, man. Anyway, yeah. anyway, to wrap this up, uh, Devin, I was just going to say um, it, it's a disappointment when you have legends and, and people you look up to, and I don't know if you've experienced it, but it's it's very disheartening um, when you when you sometimes when you meet you hear that saying when you meet your heroes you're you're truly disappointed. Unfortunately, a lot of times I wasn't with Rick. It was actually an enjoy, enjoyable experience and uh, something I won't ever uh, forget. But Anyway, on that note, the documentary left me feeling sad and crappy, and um, I hope everyone's healed from it. And on that note, thank you for watching the Hannibal TV.